Right now on Morning News Now, critical deadline. Former President Donald Trump's legal team now has just hours to respond to a Justice Department request. The special counsel is asking for a protective order, which would keep Trump from commenting publicly on the case. This as Trump's lawyers brace for yet another indictment, this time in Georgia. We'll have team coverage with the latest. Also this morning, a state of emergency in Alaska. At least two homes there were swept away by floodwaters. Look at this video from a melting glacier. And on the East Coast, it's looking like a soggy start to this week as storms threaten several states with heavy rain, hail, even tornadoes. We are tracking it all. Plus, a shared struggle. It's a challenge for many new mothers. We'll break down why breastfeeding can be tough and how it takes a toll not just physically, but also emotionally. And soccer shocker, it's not the outcome we wanted to see. This morning, Team USA is out of the Women's World Cup after falling to Sweden on penalty kicks. More on the wild and controversial tiebreaker that ended their run, and it all came down to a fraction of a centimeter. Every centimeter counts, my goodness. Oh, I woke up to the go. news yesterday. I, I wasn't watching it live, and I was like, oh, not a great day to start. Not a great way to start. Soccer. Yeah, absolutely. I know that. Ooh, overnight news, sad. Good morning. Good to have you with us on this Monday. I'm Jill Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Thank you for joining us. We're going to get started this morning with that looming deadline for former President Donald Trump. His legal team has until 5 o'clock today to respond to the prosecution's request for a protective order. Prosecutors want to bar the former president from publicly disclosing some of the evidence gathered in this case. Over the weekend, Trump's team filed a motion to move that deadline to Thursday, saying they needed more time to discuss U.S. District Court Judge Tanya Chuck had denied that request. This comes as the former president ramps up his rhetoric, both online and on the campaign trail, trying to discredit the trial. Trump released a flurry of social media posts aimed at Judge Chuckin, his former vice president, Mike Pence, and the Biden administration. He also attacked special counsel Jack Smith in public comments on Saturday during a Republican dinner in South Carolina, calling Smith deranged. He has denied any wrongdoing in the case and continues to down play the charges against him. We have NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalo standing by this morning. Let's start, though, with NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard with the latest details. Vaughn, good morning. That protective order requested by the prosecution, what are the Justice Department's biggest concerns here, and how is Trump's legal team responding to today's deadline? Right. This was a similar protective order that the special counsel's office was able to place on Donald Trump in the classified documents case. The prosecutor's argument is that Donald Trump should not be able to disseminate or publicly talk about evidence that is presented to his attorneys through this discovery process ahead of the trial here. And the DOJ, in their filing on Friday, wrote, quote, such a restriction is particularly important in this case because the defendant has previously issued public statements on social media media regarding witnesses, judges, attorneys, and others associated with legal matters pending against him. I mean, just one of the social media posts from last week from Trump was, quote, if you go after me, I'm coming after you. The prosecutors have suggested that Trump's revealing of any potential information could have a harmful chilling effect on witnesses or adversely affect uh, the justice system as it plays out over, this, uh, uh, over these months ahead. So, Vaughn, I mean, despite concerns about the former president's activity on social media, Trump was posting about his former VP, Mike Pence, over the weekend. In a true social post, Trump said that Pence, quote, has gone to the dark side. Now, keep in mind, the defense has said Pence could be a star witness for Trump during this trial. How is Pence responding to all this, and how central is he becoming in this case? Right. This is a perfect example to what the Department of Justice in its filing on Friday suggested could amount to potential witness tampering here. He's calling Mike Pence delusional. Mike Pence very well could take the stand in the trial. He testified before the grand jury as part of the special counsel's investigation. And uh, if a judge were to see this as being a pressure campaign on a potential witness, that is where Donald Trump, if this protective order were to be implemented, uh, could face uh, potentially additional legal challenges. Challenges. I want to let you hear from Mike Pence yesterday directly respond to uh, Donald Trump's attacks against him. Take a listen. You know, I testified before the grand jury under a subpoena after we got clarification from the court about protections uh, that I have under the Constitution as the president uh, of the Senate. But I, I have no plans to testify. But uh, look, we'll, we'll always we'll always comply with the law. 
Mike Pence had said that he did not believe that Donald Trump should be indicted in this matter here, but at the same time, he is running for president against his former boss, and you saw Donald Trump's uh, comments laid out in the indictment last week, suggesting that Mike Pence was, quote, too honest. Mike Pence's presidential campaign right now has T-shirts online for sale with the words, quote, too honest on them. Joe. So Trump, let's talk about him, also took to social media to request that the judge, Judge Chutkin, recuse herself from the case, claiming that he would not be able to get a fair trial in Washington. Has his legal team suggested they would actually file a motion to have this done and have the judge's past rulings indicated that she might actually recuse herself or, or change locations at all? There's no reason to believe at this time that the judge would recuse uh, herself or that a motion to change the venue uh, would ultimately be granted. Donald Trump has made these suggestions in the past, and it has not been ruled in his favor. Yesterday, his top attorney in this case, he did come forward and say that they intended to potentially file a motion to have this change of venue, and his suggestion for a place to move this trial would be West Virginia, because he cited it is more diverse, of course. Uh, their concern here is that a D.C. jury pool uh, is uh, potentially much more anti-Trump. Of course, on the flip side of this, in 2020, West Virginia, Donald Trump won by a two-to-one margin. Uh, so, of course, if this were to go before a judge, there would be much to consider. Joe. All right. Von Hilliard kicking us off this hour. Von, thanks so much. Now, Trump's attorney, John Lauro, over the weekend defended his client, saying Trump's efforts to try and overturn the election were merely aspirational. He's also defending that now infamous call that Trump made to Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, asking him to find votes in the 2020 election. Raffensperger said Trump was threatening him, but Lauro maintains Trump did nothing wrong. Here's Meet the Press moderator Chuck Todd now with more on that interview. Well, hello, Joe and Savannah. This week on Meet the Press, it was Trump attorney John Lauro who joined me to discuss Donald Trump's threats to Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, among the other things he's accused of. Of course, in that phone call, he told him to find votes after Trump lost the state in 2020. Here's the reaction. What he was asking for is, is for Raffensperger to get to the truth. He believed that there were in excess of, of 10,000 votes that were counted illegally. And what he was asking for is the Secretary of State to act appropriately and find uh, these votes that were counted um, illegally. Uh, that was an asper Hold on one second. That was an aspirational ask. He's entitled to petition even state government. But that doesn't, that doesn't involve an obstruction of federal government. But, what the Biden administration has said is somehow President Trump obstructed a federal proceeding. That relates to what was going on in the states. And yeah. President Trump had every right to ask the Secretary of State, I believe that this election was conducted improperly. There are deficiencies here. I want to see if there are more than 10,000 votes or whatever the number was that were counted illegally. Once again, that's core political speech. Bringing up a criminal violation is somehow speech. I mean, it's the way it sounds like somebody saying that's a mighty fine, uh, it's a mighty fine restaurant you have there. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. I mean, that's it's no different than I mean. Oh, it's, it's a big threat have, here have to read, bring up have a you criminal read the First offense. Amendment? <laughs> Oh, no, no, Chuck, have you read the First Amendment? I mean, political speech is the most protected speech um, that we have under our Constitution. You can see the entire interview and more at meetthepress.com. You can also get more Meet the Press right here on NBC News Now every single weekday at 4 p.m. All right, Chuck Todd, thank you so much. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos, not a pickup right there. Hey, Danny, good morning. So John Lauro had made the rounds on all the Sunday talk shows, laying out his defense of the former president. I do want to talk about something he just said there in his conversation with Chuck that we played, saying that his request to find the 10,000 votes in Georgia was, quote, aspirational. Now, Lauro also used that phrase when describing Trump's statements to Pence about halting the certification of votes on January 6th. Walk us through what you have gleaned here. This tells us about their legal strategy based on these few comments so far. I think it's long been the defense's position, even before there was an indictment, that the find me 11,000 vote statement was defensible. I've, I've frankly never understood why there's been so much focus on that win, as Chuck Todd very expertly pointed out. In the very next sentence, Donald Trump does say something to the effect that Raffensperger and his attorney may be violating federal, I believe, criminal law. And that's not just someone like you or I saying that, Savannah. That is the president of the United right. States, the head of the executive branch, which contains the DOJ. And so I've long uh, had a problem with everybody focusing on this find me 11,000 votes when 
Uh, I think far more damaging is the potential threat. And you see Laura there struggle with that somewhat because he just says that he dismisses that as protected by the First Amendment. I do agree there's an argument to be made that find me 11,000 votes. Uh, it could be a demand. It could be a threat. It could also be aspirational. But far more damaging to Trump is the next sentence. And I think the indictment uh, also represents that, even though the find me 11,000 votes is certainly flashier uh, for whatever reason. Uh, threatening someone with federal crimes when you are the head of the federal government and the DOJ, that to me is far more ominous. Danny, I also want to ask you about something else that's making headlines from this conversation, um, something that Laura said while discussing the former president's alleged pressure campaign to get Mike Pence to reverse the election. Let's listen to that, and I'll ask you on the other side. He said the president asked him to violate the Constitution, no, which is another way of saying he, he asked him to break said, the law. He never said... No, that's wrong. That's wrong. A, a, a technical violation of the Constitution is not a violation of criminal law. That's just plain wrong. And to say that is contrary to decades of legal statutes. Let's Danny, explain that. A technical violation of the Constitution is not a violation of criminal law. Is that true? Explain that to us. That statement, isolated, is true. I mean, the Constitution contains, uh, it's not a criminal code. It actually contains a crime like uh, treason. It defines uh, that crime. But uh, otherwise, it is not a criminal code. It does not impose penalties for most of its violations. A good example is when the police violate your Fourth Amendment search and seizure rights, that evidence may be excluded as part of the exclusionary rule, but it's not a crime. We don't arrest police for a, a bad search of a car. So that statement by itself is technically correct, that a violation of the Constitution uh, is not a crime. There are a lot of violations of laws that are not crimes, but there are violations of criminal codes that are indeed crimes. So, look, it is a, it is a technically correct statement, but I, that's not what anything in the indictment alleges. The, the indictment doesn't allege cr constitutional criminal code violations because really, with the exception, very few exceptions, that doesn't exist. It alleges criminal code violations under the U.S. Code. And Danny, quickly, before I let you go, let's talk about this protective order, this 5 p.m. deadline that Trump's team is facing. As we mentioned earlier over the weekend, Trump did post on social media going after Pence, also the judge, and then special counsel Jack Smith calling him deranged, as we've heard before. Do these statements go against the magistrate's warning to Trump at his arraignment last week? Yes, the magistrate, interestingly enough, warned Trump, but that magistrate will never be seen in the case again because of the way federal procedure works. It's really the district court judge that's going to enter uh, this protective order. And look, there's been a lot of talk about this protective order. The bottom line is this. If the parties don't agree, and there's no way they're going to agree, they're just not going to do it, then the judge is just going to enter a protective order. And Trump is not helping himself over the weekend by already lashing out because it gives something concrete to the district judge to say, hmm, this is no longer theoretical. This defendant is already uh, misbehaving on social media. So now I should err on the side of caution and make this protective order stricter. Not a gag order, mm. but a protective order to make sure that he doesn't disseminate discovery. Danny Savalos, thank you so much. Breaking news this morning out of Pennsylvania, where at least three people are dead following a charter bus crash. State police say the crash happened shortly before midnight on Interstate 81 between Hershey and Harrisburg. As many as 50 people were on the bus when it crashed into a passenger vehicle, then flipped on its side. Police say several passengers were taken to Hershey Medical Center for injuries ranging from minor to critical. The names of those who were killed have not yet been released. Authorities are still working to notify their families, and the cause of the crash remains under investigation this morning. And now to Alaska, where a declaration of emergency has been issued for the city of Juneau after historic glacial flooding over the weekend. At least two homes were swept away and several others were damaged after water levels eroded riverbanks. Well, luckily no one was injured. The National Weather Service says while flood waters are receding, more erosion could occur as riverbanks are still unstable from the record-breaking flooding. Well, from storms in the east to record-breaking temps in the south, millions of Americans are waking up to severe weather threats this morning. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us now with your morning news now weather. Hey, Michelle, good morning. 
Hey there, guys. Great to see you. Yeah, we're busy once again. We're starting out with that dangerous heat across the south, and we're looking at the chance for severe storms as we go throughout this afternoon and evening hours. We have a first batch of rain moving through portions of the northeast the Ohio Valley early this morning. Then we'll get a little bit of a break, and then later on this afternoon, once we get the sun going, we're going to see some strong to severe storms that could have some really gusty winds. Even a few tornadoes are possible, and we're concerned about the chance for flash flooding. So radar showing us that we see the first part of this storm. This is a warm front that's lifting through, and then we'll see the cold front coming through later on today. You could see it here on Futurecast, that blue line. That's a cold front. That's going to go through some really warm, humid air, and that's going to bring the chance for some strong to severe storms. Again, torrential, torrential rainfall is a possibility. We could see up to four inches in some spots, and we could see two inches per hour. So the concern there is for some flash flooding. And then tomorrow, we'll see it move off to the east. Storms lingering across the New England area, we could see the renewed chance for some flash flooding as we go throughout Tuesday. So as Monday looks, we're looking at lots of people affected by severe weather, 87 million people impacted from the northeast into the mid-Atlantic, portions of the Tennessee Valley, the southeast, even into the south central states with winds gusting over 65 miles per hour especially where you see that orange shading. So uh, major cities along I-95, D.C., Philadelphia, down through parts of the mid-Atlantic could see some really strong storms. Flash flooding, again, could see two inches per hour, especially where you see that darker blue color. So Burlington, Syracuse, New York City, D.C. could see some really heavy rainfall. And we're expecting even up to four inches of rain in some spots. This is through Tuesday. So we'll see that storm system lingering over New England. That's where we're going to see the highest amounts in parts of the interior parts of New England and also of the Northeast. Now, as far as the heat goes, dangerous heat, 70 million people impacted from Southern California into the South Central States, the Gulf Coast, the Southeast, into the Carolinas, where you see the pink guys, that's your excessive heat warnings. We're looking at triple digits once again. Records will fall, and we're going to feel like over 115 in some spots. Back to you. The humidity felt like about 150% this morning oh, when yeah. I woke up and, God, and I left. So. Pouring rain. It's yeah. gross. Yeah. All right, Michelle, thanks so much. Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, making waves. We're going to introduce you to one man on a mission to keep trash out of the ocean before it even gets there. At first, though, after the break, tension rising off the Alaskan coast after the Chinese and Russian militaries were spotted on joint patrol. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We're back with new information about some tense moments off the coast of Alaska last week. U.S. Navy ships responded to nearly a dozen Chinese and Russian military vessels that appeared to be operating together. And this is not the first close call between the U.S., Chinese and Russian militaries. NBC News correspondent Aaron Gilchrist has the details. It's being called an incursion, and it happened here near the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. 11 military ships from Russia and China patrolling the waters, according to a statement from both of Alaska's senators, adding that four American Navy destroyers were sent to shadow them until they left the area. What is the U.S. signaling to Russia and China by putting destroyers in the water near their exercises? Well, I think it was, a, again, an attempt to uh, counter signal that we're aware of their presence, that we have military power in the region. The patrol never entered U.S. waters, according to U.S. Northern Command, confirming to NBC News that air and sea assets conducted operations to assure the defense of the United States and Canada. It is the latest aggressive maneuver by the Chinese military after this close call between Chinese and American warships in June in the Taiwan Strait and this Chinese warplane dangerously close to an American military plane in May. Last month, Lester Holt visited NORAD in Alaska, where a top general there warned that Alaska was on the front lines. Any threats coming from Russia, China, and that part of the world into America, they're, they're first going to cross into Alaska airspace. Uh, this, this is kind of on the, on the front lines for, for America and Canada. Alaska senators today renewing calls for increased investment in military power in Alaska. And this is at least the third year in a row that Chinese naval ships have made close passes during these military training exercises. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu this morning appears to be pulling back on one part of a controversial judicial overhaul plan. In an interview with Bloomberg, he said he now only plans to change the judge selection committee, a move which is still considered one of the most important parts of the new laws that's being promoted by the Israeli government. Here's a little of what he had to say in that interview. I don't think we should move from one extreme where we have perhaps the most activist judicial court on the planet to getting to a point where the legislature, our Knesset, can just knock out any decision that the court makes. There has to be a balance. I'm absolutely sure that uh, Israel will come out stable, 
uh, and successful and democratic. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now from Tel Aviv with more. So, Raf, we've seen weeks of protests in Israel over this overhaul plan. We should point out Netanyahu has not publicly announced this new direction that we heard beyond this Bloomberg interview, nor has he spoken with Israeli press about it yet. But how significant is this move right now? You just spoke with him a little over a week ago. Is it surprising? Yeah, Joe, there are two ways to look at this. One perspective is this is Netanyahu acknowledging that what was initially a very large scale reform program, judicial overhaul, is now become much, much narrower. He's saying he's limiting his ambition to just two laws. The first one that passed two weeks ago, which limited the Supreme Court's ability to strike down government decisions. And then this other one you mentioned, which would give the government more control over the appointment of judges to the Supreme Court. But, Joe, the other perspective on this is that just those two changes to the law on their own would still be a revolution in how Israel's judiciary works. The protesters say they are going to stay on the streets to fight both of those pieces of legislation. It is worth saying Netanyahu says these changes will bring Israel more in line with other democracies, including the United States, where politicians play a much bigger role in appointing the judges. You Jeff. know, Raf, these changes, this new legislation goes in front of the Supreme Court next month. What's the latest on that hearing? Yeah, so September 12th is a date that all of Israel has in its calendar now. That is when you're going to have this historic hearing at the Supreme Court. All 15 of the Supreme Court's judges will be sitting together, which has never happened before in Israeli history. And they're going to be deciding whether or not to strike down that legislation that passed two weeks ago that weakens their own power. And if they do, Joe, that will be the first time the court has ever struck down what's known here as a basic law, semi-constitutional law. And when I sat down with Netanyahu, I asked him, if the court strikes down your legislation, will you respect their ruling? Take a listen. If Israel's Supreme Court strikes down your legislation, will you abide by their ruling? I think we have to follow two rules. One is Israeli governments abide by the decisions of the Supreme Court. And at the same time, the Supreme Court respects the uh, basic laws, which are the closest thing we have to a constitution. Uh, I think we should uh, have we should keep both principles, and I, and I hope we do. Joe, I asked him twice, and neither time would he give me a straight answer saying yes, he would respect the court's decision, which has a lot of Israelis worried this country could be heading for a constitutional crisis. All right, Raf Sanchez, appreciate your reporting as always. Thank you. It was perhaps the most heartbreaking and agonizing finish imaginable. The U.S. women's soccer team knocked out of the World Cup truly by the narrowest mark. Yeah, that's right. For more, we're joined by NBC's Molly Hunter in Melbourne, Australia. Molly, Team USA outplayed Sweden, but ultimately came up just short. Tell us about this. Guys, absolutely heartbreaking. My voice is so hoarse. I was screaming well, so loudly in the stadium, but a devastating way to go out in penalty kicks for the U.S. This is their worst performance in World Cup history. And in the stadium, you could see the shock on U.S. goalkeeper Alyssa Nair's face. This wasn't the tournament they wanted. Take a look. It was a devastating way to go out, marking the end of their run for a historic three-peat and the end of an era. I can't quite locate all the feelings yet. Megan Rapino closing out her fourth and final World Cup. Obviously, I know this moment has been coming, you know, at some point. Um, obviously, it's disappointing to be out this early. After 90 minutes of regulation time, two extra 15-minute halves, a scoreless game, a tense and quiet stadium, it all came down to penalty kicks. Rapino unbelievably missing her shot, but she wasn't alone. On the final kick from the Swedish team, U.S. goalie Alyssa Nair appears to save the ball. She blocks it, then a second touch to clear it. But on review using goal line technology, it was determined that the whole ball crossed the line, giving the deciding goal to Sweden. We just lost the World Cup by a millimeter. <laughs> um, that's tough. To come up short hurts. Um, it's going to hurt for a long time. Nair looking stunned, Rapino instantly hugging her teammate. Co-captain Lindsey Horan told me they brought the fire. We know how we can play. We can be calm, we can be poised, we can be confident on the ball, and that's what you saw today. The team's loyal fans who had traveled halfway across the world were gutted. Ah, we were so, we tried so hard, we just couldn't finish. Oh, I just, uh, I mean, it was heartbreak, it's heavy. But U.S. coach Vladko Antonovsky said he wouldn't have done anything differently. Emotional, speaking to reporters minutes after the match. For this team, 
the future is bright. I want to be there for them. You know, I love them. I love them all. Now, guys, I was in that press conference room with the U.S. coach, Vladko Andonovsky. He was visibly emotional. He'd said he'd just seen a lot of those players in tears. He says he loves them all. But this sport globally, you guys, is different because of Megan Rapino. And she told us after the match that she's leaving it in good hands. She says she's loved every bit of her career. She'll miss it to death. But that right now is the time to go, and that's okay. It was pretty amazing to see her come out after. Oh, absolutely. Molly Hunter, thank you so much. Well, coming up, a woman whose story fueled an anti-vaccine movement is now speaking out almost 15 years later. Were you faking it? Definitely not. Unfortunately, I, would, I know the symptoms look bizarre. Up next, what she says happened to her all those years ago and why she's no longer against vaccines. Plus, new moms facing a similar challenge. More on the impacts breastfeeding can have, not just on the body, but also on the mind. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. Today is the last day of World Breastfeeding Week. It is a time to promote the short and long-term benefits of breastfeeding for babies and breastfeeding parents. There are also many challenges which can take an emotional and physical toll on those new parents. Well, our next guest, Dr. Edith Bracho Sanchez, is a pediatrician and a mother who breastfed her son for a year. She wrote this article, though, for She Knows, highlighting the difficulties that she faces, that she faced at the time. And the doctor joins us now. It's great to see you. Hi, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, such an important topic topic and really incredible that you wrote about it and you're kind of being vulnerable about it. But I mean, I think new parents are so used to hearing, you know, that this is what you're supposed to do for your child, that this is the best way it's going to impact them for the rest of their lives. But I know it can be so difficult. I mean, I don't have kids myself, but I have best friends who have walked me through the struggles that they've had. Tell us just why it was important for you to share your story. So you're exactly right. I mean, I think so many people have heard of the benefits. So many people have heard of what you're supposed to do. Right. And we don't talk enough about the challenge and when we don't talk about the challenges, we don't prepare for those challenges. Mm. It's really no surprise that 60% of women do not meet their breastfeeding goals. That is because we're not mm. talking about the challenges that come up beyond the, you know, establishing your supply and you're going to have some cracked nipples and some pain, all of those things most women have heard. They have not heard about the mental health, about the emotional struggles, and we're not preparing for them, Savannah. So tell us about some of the challenges you face, but both mentally and physically. Yeah, so I have to tell you, as a pediatrician, I was ready for the physical challenges, right? It's so funny. I remember the day that I gave birth, I put my son on the breast, and the nurse said to me, oh, you've done this before. You're ready. You've done this before. And I said, oh, no, he's my first. I'm just a pediatrician. So I was ready for those challenges. What I wasn't ready for was the anxiety that comes with carrying the mental load of remembering when you're going to feed your child. I wasn't ready for the loneliness that kicks in in the middle of the night. I wasn't ready for the resentment that I felt towards my partner for almost leaving me. And listen, in the in the months since I stopped breastfeeding, I've come to understand that he too took a toll, right? Like his life changed too. But in my mind, I always had it worse. And in my mind, I resented him for it, not to mention professionally mm. all the hit that I took, right? And, and how I perceived myself as falling behind professionally. Wow, such an important point about the partner aspect that maybe people are so not prepared for. Mm -hmm. um, if someone is facing similar difficulties, either they're having difficulties physically with it or emotionally, like you're saying, medically, what should you do? So talk about it. And it can start with talking about it with your partner, with your pediatrician, with a lactation consultant. I mean, these people are angels on earth. I mean, they mm. really know so much about breastfeeding and they realize that the experience of every woman is so unique. And honestly, let's seek each other out. We live in an era in which women are no longer suffering alone. We're being candid, we are sharing. So let's mm. talk about it. And I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to talk about it on She Knows That Com. And I hope that people go and read about it. Uh -huh. And we're so grateful that you came here to talk about it. It's so important and incredible that you're being so vulnerable with it. Dr. Edith Bracho Sanchez, always great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Now let's travel back in time to revisit a story that made headlines across the country in 2009. That's when a cheerleader went viral, claiming she suffered a mysterious illness after getting a seasonal flu shot. Many questioned her claims, yet her story took off and she became a poster child for the anti-vaccine movement. But now for the first time, she is speaking out, talking exclusively to NBC News senior reporter Brandi Zadrozny, sharing what she wants people to know about her symptoms and vaccines. You might not remember Desiree Townsend, 
But what about the flu shot cheerleader? A 2009 media sensation and early viral meme. If this field was a song where the blood goes now too. She claimed she'd been injured by a seasonal flu shot, that it caused a twisted, jerking walk that disappeared when she ran or went backwards. The anti-vaccine movement was struggling, but saw an opportunity and embraced her as its new poster girl. That's Desiree. Hi, nice to meet you. Desiree is not going to talk to you. But... Yeah. but they disappeared when Desiree was outed as a supposed faker. Were you faking it? Definitely not. Unfortunately, I, would, I know the symptoms look bizarre. Now, 14 years later, she's speaking out for the first time since the ordeal, motivated by the rise in anti-vaxxers in a post-pandemic world. <laughs> and hoping to warn others who might get caught up in what she calls the anti-vaccine PR machine. In the end of the day, these people are just gonna use you. COVID-19 wasn't on anybody's minds in 2009, but the country was in the grips of a different pandemic. We have an update tonight on the swine flu virus. Swine flu outbreak. Swine flu death. While health officials encouraged the public to get an H1N1 vaccine, a group of activists, led by an actress, was doing the opposite. Without a doubt in my mind, I believe vac vaccinations triggered Evan's autism. So I think they need to wake up and stop hurting our kids. Those false theories about vaccines had been debunked, but Desiree's story was making the rounds. It is one of the most talked about stories we've ever had on Inside Edition. A pretty cheerleader ambassador for an NFL team, strangely disabled by a vaccine, was ratings gold. And Jenny McCarthy's organization, Generation Rescue, wanted to use it to bring attention to their cause, a crusade spreading the disproven theories that vaccines caused autism and that unconventional treatments could cure it. I was young, I was 25, I needed help. And I just had these people come to me and said, well, we'll give you that help, but here's the cost. You have to believe what we believe. Generation Rescue asked Desiree to star in an anti-vaccine documentary. You need to sit up. Come on. Just for a second. It was never made, but the footage was left with Desiree, who shared it with NBC News. They took her to Dr. Rashid Batar, a controversial osteopath popular for his advertised miracle cures that could supposedly detox patients. Everything's going to be better, but the world will be made. The unconventional treatments seemed to alleviate her symptoms, at least initially. You're a miracle worker. Anti vaccine activists claimed victory. And in the Generation Rescue footage, they strategized about Desiree's future, even calling her the next Jenny McCarthy. She's going to be able to help a lot of people. Mm -hmm. She's going to be able to make a, make a huge ruckus. But back home, when the cameras were off, Desiree still felt sick. When you have nothing left, no other option, of course you're going to turn to anybody who would come to you and say, we can help you. I just didn't realize what the cost of that help was. We reached out to Jenny McCarthy for comment and didn't hear back. Former Generation Rescue President Stan Kurtz told us via text he's been, quote, out of this space for a long time and didn't respond to further questions. Dr. Rashid Batar died in May. His family didn't respond to requests for comment. And according to her medical records, Desiree continued to seek treatment for her condition. But then a series of new reports cast doubt on her story. One from Inside Edition was most damning. It showed Desiree playing with her dogs, walking normally and driving. We've been trying to reach you and you have not been returning our phone calls. Oh, I'm sorry. What's going on? It looks like you've made a complete recovery. Uh, well, I don't want to say complete recovery. I still have a lot of cognitive, cognitive issues. With that, much of the country had decided, it seemed, that the whole thing had been a hoax and Generation Rescue dropped her. I want people to know that I did not fake an illness. I am not a scammer. I am not a hoaxer. I'm not anti-vaccine. I'm not a liar. But by then, the impact of Desiree's story was out of her control. Doctors and public health officials at the time warned about the power of a story like Desiree's. Dr. Paul Offit, director of the Vaccine Education Center at Philadelphia's Children's Hospital, discussed one account of Max vaccine hesitancy in an interview with PBS. I spoke recently at a high school near here. There were about 200 people in the audience. And, and I asked them how many had gotten the influenza vaccine, and about half raised their hands. Of the half that didn't raise their hands, they said they, they didn't get it because on YouTube, they saw a, a Redskins cheerleader say that she had gotten the, the vaccine and had a so-called dystonic reaction. Now, almost a decade and a half later, he says anti-vaxxers still use personal anecdotes to boost their claims, whether they're true or not. 
We're humans. We're compelled by story. We're not so compelled by statistics. We're not so compelled by data. So if you do studies showing that that the influenza vaccine doesn't cause what you're seeing uh, with Desiree Jennings, that's not nearly as as powerful as her saying that it did. And Desiree, pulled into the whirlwind back then, now regrets her impact. If I caused anyone to not receive a vaccine or put their children at risk or themselves at risk, yes, I do feel an immense amount of guilt for that, but I really hope and pray that that didn't happen. Desiree says her moment in the anti-vaccine spotlight has cost her jobs, relationships, and her reputation. And she no longer believes a vaccine is what caused her health problems. I think I was already showing symptoms of this autoimmune disease. It's just that all of these variables came together in a perfect storm and it just, the timing looked like it was a vaccine, but it was not, it was, it, it was correlation, not causation. Desiree turned towards science. She graduated in 2019 from the University of California, Irvine with a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and molecular biology. When the COVID vaccine became available, she took it and a booster. But the COVID pandemic brought out hundreds of other people like Desiree, posting unverified accounts of strange reactions attributed, they said, to the vaccines. Generation Rescue shut down in 2019, but new leaders and organizations took its place, this time stoking fears over COVID vaccines. Now, Desiree hopes she can set the record straight on vaccines and warn others from joining the anti-vaccine movement. What would you say to people who get wrapped in to this industry? I would tell them to run because they're never going to benefit from that. You're going to be used. Brandy Zadrasny, NBC News. Thanks to Brandy for that report. Mm -hmm. Coming up, one man making an ocean of a difference. After the break, see how he's cleaning up the sea by turning his attention to the rivers. Welcome back. Financial headlines now. Oil giant Saudi Aramco saw a steep drop in profits in its second quarter. That's right. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us now with that and other money news. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Yeah, so Saudi state oil giant Aramco reporting a nearly 40% drop in quarterly profits today. The company citing weaker oil prices during the quarter and thinner refining margins. Oil prices are down from the highs of last year following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But crude is now at its highest level since April after Saudi Arabia and Russia pledged to extend production cuts for another month, further tightening global supplies. Electric vehicle maker Lucid is cutting prices on its air luxury sedans by as much as $12,400. This amid rising competition in the U.S., the industry and a price war sparked by Tesla. Lucid says the discounts will be valid as long as supplies last. The company had to raise prices more than a year ago due to rising costs for raw materials and supply chain bottlenecks. But rising interest rates and recession worries have dampened consumer demand prompting market leader Tesla to cut prices this year. Barbie is a billion dollar winner. The Warner Brothers movie topping that mark at the worldwide box office after just two weeks in theaters. It's just one of about half a dozen films since the pandemic to gross a billion dollars in ticket sales. It's also the first U.S. film directed by one woman to reach that mark. The success of Barbie coming as both the writers and screen actors skills remain on strike, guys. It is still so. We still haven't seen it yet, and we were looking I over the week. Weekend and we, can, we huh? couldn't find, like, it was just front row seats available, which is great wow. to see. Right. Still popular. Yeah, that is still yeah. going Absolutely. on. I know. Oh, it's so good. Savannah, have you seen it? <laughs> I can't, not yet. I can't wait. I can't. Hopefully, this Hopefully weekend. Hopefully, this so weekend. Hopefully, this weekend. Have some yes. good talk to here. We'll, we'll reserve right. tickets for three weeks from now. Maybe we'll <laughs> yeah. see this then. Thanks, Savannah. All right. Here is a staggering number to consider. The nonprofit environmental group Ocean Conservancy says an estimated 11 million metric tons of plastic enter the world's oceans every year. All that trash damages, of course, Marie ecosystems and threatens the sea life living there while one man is working to change that he's coming up with a creative way to tackle the problem nbc news now anchor Gotti schwartz has his story it's so rare to see a moment that could change the world 
But in these waters, with more plastic than fish, a 16-year-old asked himself a question we should never forget. I asked myself, uh, why can't we just clean this up? Ten years later, Boyan Slat has dedicated his life to answering that single question. He's been pretty successful. This is one of your babies, huh? One of my yachts, yes. Wow, one of your yachts. On behalf of Angelinos uh, that live here, thank you for this. Interceptor 007 in Los Angeles stopped 77 tons of trash from reaching the Pacific during the runoff from all those atmospheric rivers this year. We were surprised by the amount of trash that came down. But the oceans are massive, and these interceptors are tiny, and no one knows that better than Boyan. Considering the scale of the problem, giving up was never an option. His genius is knowing that in order to tackle a problem of this magnitude, you need hard data. Boyan is responsible for the international scientific expedition across the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and much of what humanity knows about the patch and those currents comes from him. His organization has also perfected this dragnet system that is currently able to collect four tons of trash every day. The system we have in the ocean right now sweeps an area the size of a football field every 10 seconds. Wow. Satisfying for us to watch, but Boyan sees it differently. We also need to stop new plastic from, from reaching the ocean. Using AI-powered cameras, Boyan and Ocean Cleanup have analyzed dozens of rivers around the world and learned that 80% of ocean surface plastic comes from just 1% of the world's rivers. And so far, there is one river that keeps them up at night, the Rio Las Vacas in Guatemala. The river in Guatemala is off the chart. We uh, experienced what we call a trash tsunami, like a flash flood of plastic coming down the mountain. You're seeing just miles and miles of coastline full of garbage that slipped through our fingers and just felt personally. But a year later, their interceptor stopped over a thousand tons of trash in the first month alone. On one hand, the past 10 years have been way more difficult than I could have ever imagined. On the other hand, I'm also more optimistic than ever that we can actually solve this problem. And it all started when you were 16 trying to learn how to scuba dive. Yeah, it got a bit out of hand, I would say. <laughs> a bit out of yeah. hand, fortunately <laughs> for the rest of us. Just incredible to see our thanks to Gotti for that fantastic report. Good news when you see a potential solution to something. You can actually see the difference. Yes, that it's exactly. All right, coming up, a new sport that is causing an old age racket. Up next, why some neighborhoods are seeing a spike in noise complaints over games of pickleball. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. It is the dog days of summer, and what better way to cool off than catching some waves, which is what these dogs did at the sixth annual World Dog Surfing Championship this weekend. Thousands turned out for the event yesterday just outside of San Francisco to see 14 four-legged stars take to the water. The canine surfing pros competed in various categories with the top dogs taking home the Golden Surfy Award. Skyler, one of the competitors, had a possum day and received four awards <laughs> becoming the overall champ there were several other activities on land including a dog beach fashion contest and dog adoptions now it's it's hard enough to train your dog to do basic things i don't know how you train your dog to surf and joe what what were all these dogs you're all good boys good girls <laughs> good boys <laughs> thank good. you very much yeah. just so you know i just took a video of you with a giant picture of a dog surfing, <laughs> uh, over your shoulder well pickleball is the fastest growing sport in the country but not everyone is a fan some homeowners say it's loud and disruptive leading to noise complaints in some neighborhoods and more drastic measures even in others nbc news correspondent stephen romo explains these are the sounds of fun <laughs> and fury it's a staccato of almost like gunshots. As the game of pickleball has exploded throughout the country, so too has the noise. It starts at around 6.45, 7 sometimes, goes on till about 9. Bruce Montgomery lives just feet from a court. When you're in your home and you hear that pop, 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 what is your feeling? It's stress, you know, it's uh, anxiety. It, you find that you can't concentrate as well. The pickleball courts popped up in their neighborhood in the Chicago suburbs over a year ago. It's like torture, like drop, 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 and it's constant. And it's not just here. 
It's happening in Laguna Beach, California, where one resident clocked the sound at nearly 80 decibels. That's roughly equal to the sound of big city traffic. It has destroyed our peace of mind. Uh, starts early morning, all day. And on Cape Cod, it was so bad, Rob Mastroianni moved out of his home. USA Pickleball claims the problem isn't that widespread. Our estimates are that uh, there's probably less than 1% of, of all the facilities out there that are experiencing this issue. What would you say to those people in those neighborhoods? Let's find a solution you know, that includes the, the equipment and materials uh, rather than closing the ports. Some solutions are already out there, like these noise canceling paddles. Back outside Chicago, they've tried to get their town to move the courts out, but to no oh, avail. Bruce doesn't blame the players for creating all this racket. He blames the town. Most of the players we spoke to sympathized with the neighbors. I get it. I have a house, too, and I can understand that this can be kind of a hassle waking you up at night. But uh, in general, the people who do play, uh, they're pretty respectful. A growing court battle putting so many communities in a pickle. Stephen Romo, NBC News, Lyle, Illinois. <sighs> The pros and cons of pickleball. Yeah, I mean, you do, you hear it. That you was do a hear great it, yeah. use of playing that sound just so you get it if you haven't heard it yourself. But, oof, I don't know. People so love happens. pickleball. I love that there's ones that are quieter, so. Yeah, I know. I wonder why. I wonder if it, like, impacts play or otherwise. Let's just we'll find make out. it a requirement. <laughs> That's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us on a Monday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, soak and swelter. We are tracking extreme weather across the U.S. today. Tens of millions of Americans are under even more heat alerts this morning as high temp records are shattered in cities like New Orleans, Houston, and El Paso. Well, in Alaska, look at this shocking video of a home collapsing as that state battles historic flooding. And a new round of severe weather is taking aim at the eastern seaboard. We're covering it all in just a moment with a look at your week ahead. Also this morning, legal deadline. The clock is ticking for former President Trump and his defense team to respond to the Justice Department's request for a protective order. The outcome of this could affect how Trump comments publicly on special counsel Jack Smith's election interference probe. It comes as another possible indictment looms, this time in Georgia, We've got the latest. Plus, one on one, it is an NBC News exclusive interview with GOP presidential candidate and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. We'll have more on his take on Trump's 2020 election fraud claims from the campaign trail. And devastation down under. Despite a worthy World Cup effort, Team USA was sent back stateside over the weekend after one final penalty kick that broke both hearts and unfortunately, the goal line. Ugh. A lot of people still just that, literally that close. It was a tough one. You know, soccer's a stressful sport. I know we're like all getting more into it here, but to watch it is like anxiety inducing. It is. So we Ugh. will hear reaction from the team coming up in just oh, a yeah. little bit. We are going to begin this morning with the severe weather that has crisscrossed the country. Now it's hitting the East Coast. Yeah, that could impact up to 76 million people from Tennessee all the way to New York. Over the weekend, heavy rainfall and flash flooding caused major issues in northeastern Missouri. You can see flood floodwaters left several drivers stranded. That's that video right there. This is while record flooding near Alaska's capital prompted a different kind of emergency. Look at this video captured the moment a house collapsed into rushing water. This is after a river there rose to record level of nearly 15 feet after part of a glacier broke off. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson is in Houston, Texas, because Priscilla, this is all coming at the southern part of the country, continues to bake under high heat alerts. We just have this wild weather going across the whole country. Good morning. Yeah, Savannah, good morning. The sun is just coming up here, and already it is 81 degrees. You see lots of folks here up early getting those laps in in the pool before the temperatures hit triple digits here, as meanwhile the northeast is being battered by severe storms and heavy flooding. This morning, bracing for storms. 
after a weekend of wild weather in the Midwest and West, with reported tornadoes and severe storms in Illinois and Colorado. That is a tornado funnel. That treacherous weather now moving east, bringing torrential rain, large hail, and wind gusts over 70 miles per hour from Tennessee to New York. In the Washington, D.C. area Sunday, lightning delaying a Beyonce concert. FedEx Field issuing a shelter in place. Fans feeling the heat as they packed into the concourse. Oh, there it goes, there it goes. This as Alaska battles historic flooding. Dramatic video capturing the moment a home collapsed in Juneau. The flooding swallowing several homes, toppling trees and prompting evacuations. And it comes as extreme heat continues to bake much of the country, especially the south and west. This is the hottest summer that I can recall. It's been pretty hard for us. The summer smashing records. El Paso recording its hottest day ever in the month of August, hitting 112 degrees Sunday. New Orleans setting 10 new record highs since the start of June. And Houston marking eight straight days of triple digit temperatures. It's so hot, it done melted the glue off the bottom of my shoes. Millions now waiting for cooler days ahead. It is like extremely, extremely hot here in Houston. So yeah, we just try to try to stay cool as best we can. And of course, the big question on everyone's mind, when can folks expect some relief? Unfortunately, the heat is going to be sticking around in places like New Mexico, Louisiana, and here in Texas. So folks are going to have to keep finding creative ways to beat the heat. One of the cool things about the YMCA that we're at is not only are there two pools, but if the water isn't exactly your jam, it also serves as a cooling center. So folks can sit inside and just soak up the free air conditioning. Savannah, mm. Joe? Yeah. Good. Well, a place to stay safe, too, when it's so hot. Priscilla, thank you so much. Let's take a closer look now at your morning news now weather. Which means Michelle Grossman is back with us. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. And as Priscilla said, we're going to see that heat continuing this week. Dangerous heat. Records continue to fall. We're going to see temperatures into the triple digits. You factor in humidity in some places, it will feel like 115. So that's a concern this week. We're also looking at stormy weather today. We're looking at some rain this morning. That's causing some uh, delays at airports along the East Coast. And then we're going to see another threat later on this afternoon with the cold front moving through. That's going to bring the chance for pretty strong storms with winds gusting over 65 miles per hour. Could see a few tornadoes as well. So the record high is a storm threat today, wet and colder in the Intermountain West. Then as we go throughout the rest of the week, by Wednesday, we're looking at flooding concerns now in portions of the Midwest. You can see those brighter colors indicating that we're expecting some really heavy rain there. And that rain will extend to the southeast as well. Still hot throughout the south central uh, parts of the nation. We're going to dry it out in the mid-Atlantic, the northeast, but it's going to be warm. And then Friday, rain returns to portions of the east. More records will fall in the south central states from the southwest through Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, into the Gulf coast states and the southeast. This is what radar looks like. This is a warm front coming through. So it's bringing some heavy rain in spots. It's bringing a little bit of lightning, but most of that lightning will hold off until later on today. Once we get the energy from the sun, we're going to see those storms really ignite throughout the evening hours. That's going to affect a lot of people's evening commutes. You can see this timestamp right around 8 o'clock with that rain coming through heavy at times. We do have flooding concerns. We have the chance for really strong winds. That's going to bring down some trees, bring down some power lines. Uh, we do have people without power at this hour, and we're going to see that number grow as we go throughout the day. And, of course, we're watching that tornado threat. Now, as we go throughout tomorrow, that cold front's going to move off to the east. We're going to see the lingering area of low pressure in New England. England. So still lots of heavy rain throughout portions of New England, especially Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire. And that flash flood risk for today, uh, where you see the darker blue, that's the likeliest place where we could see some really heavy rain. Guys, we could see two inches per hour and also for totals up to four inches over the next couple of days. So we're going to watch this very closely throughout the afternoon. Back to you both. All right, a lot of rain. All right, Michelle, thank you so much. Turning now to Washington, where the clock is ticking for former President Trump's legal team in the election interference case. The defense has until 5 p.m. today to file its response to the prosecution's protective order request. The DOJ says it's worried the former president will use some of the evidence in the case to intimidate witnesses and anyone connected to the legal cases against him. They also say Trump has already used social media to discuss the case, pointing to a post from over the weekend. On Friday afternoon, the former president said, quote, if you go after me, I am coming for you. Trump has denied any wrongdoing in this case. NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard joins us now with the latest. Von, good morning. So first of all, what can we expect to see today and what happens once this response is filed by Trump's team? 
Right. Good morning, Joe. The Trump defense attorneys had already tried to get an extension on this, and the judge refused their request. Essentially, what this protective order would do, if granted, would limit Donald Trump's ability to speak publicly about the evidence that is being presented by prosecutors to his attorneys and him. This is not a gag order. He would continue to be able to talk about the case at large, but what he would not be able to reveal publicly is the actual evidence that the Department of Justice, as part of a criminal proceeding, turns over to the defense so that they can build their case during a hearing. I mean, over the last 24 hours, Donald Trump, to note, has already taken aim at, for example, his former vice president, Mike Pence, who could very well go on uh, the uh, on the stand in a trial. And there is concern from the Department of Justice that there could be what would amount to witness tampering by Donald Trump against not only the likes of Mike Pence, but other witnesses that may go uh, before uh, a jury, but also that if information were to be publicly released by Donald Trump, it could ultimately potentially taint a jury pool as well. So Von Trump's attorney, John Lauro, truly made the rounds this weekend, appearing in all five of the Sunday morning shows, including Meet the Press, to discuss the case. We are getting some insight into how his team plans on defending the former president. I think the word of the weekend was aspirational, right? Right. I think that there has been a lot of conversation here over the last weeks about Donald Trump's lack of denials about the his actual actions ahead of January 6th and on January 6th and after January 6th. And that's why Chuck Todd on Meet the Press, when he was interviewing John Laurel, made the very specific question to Trump's defense counsel was, were they going to try to defend Donald Trump uh, against the alleged actions he took or defend the merits of the actions that Donald Trump took? Take a listen to Laurel's response. In order to have a violation of law, you have to have criminal intent, and in this case, corrupt intent. And what that means is that you have to have some desire to do something unlawful. Mm -hmm. if, your, if your attorney is telling you that you have a right to petition Congress, yeah. then that completely eliminates any criminal intent. So under those circumstances, you are not violating the law. Loro is asserting that Donald Trump truly believed that he had not lost the 2020 election, and that is why he took the actions that he took. That speaks to the lack of criminal attempt on Donald Trump's part. So, Vaughn, I mean, last week's indictment coupled with this weekend's flurry of social media posts that has given fuel to rival GOP presidential candidates, most of whom have been reluctant to criticize the former president. What are we hearing from them now? Right, Mike Pence is one of those who is still running for president himself. And he said that he welcomed the renewed attention on Donald Trump's actions around January 6th. He said that he does not believe Donald Trump should have been indicted in this case, yet said that uh, he believes that Donald Trump should not be in the White House again because he looked to subvert the U.S. Constitution. Ron DeSantis, uh, who is still his chief rival here at this point, in an exclusive interview with our colleague Dasha Burns, uh, saying here this weekend that Republicans, he believes, will... Uh, lose the presidential race next year if the if the issue on voters' minds keeps going back to January 6th of 2021 or classified documents at Mar-a-Lago, suggesting that he believes that Donald Trump is being unfairly prosecuted, but suggesting at the same time that Republican voters should move in a direction that is not Donald Trump because a Trump campaign in 2024 would focus on the past instead of the future. Yeah. All right, Vaughn, thank you so much. Well, that sets us up very nicely because that's exactly where we want to go now is this exclusive interview with our very own Dasha Burns with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Recent polling from the New York Times shows DeSantis is currently trailing frontrunner Donald Trump by 37 percentage points. But the Florida governor says he still has a shot at the Republican nomination. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns joins us now for more on this exclusive reporting, this exclusive sit down. Hi, Dasha. Good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Well, look, clearly the former president is still dominating the headlines and dominating the polls. This latest indictment has done little to soften his edge or his attacks on his GOP primary rival, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. So in our wide-ranging conversation, I asked the governor why he's not using this moment to go after the GOP frontrunner more directly. Watch. If the election is a referendum on Joe Biden's policies and the failures that we've seen, and we are presenting a positive vision for the future, we will win the presidency uh, and we will have a chance to turn the country around. If, on the other hand, 
uh, the election is not about January 20th, 2025, but January 6th, 2021, or what document was left by the toilet at Mar-a-Lago, if it's a referendum on that, we are going to lose. But and that's Trump just the reality. The race, you know with Trump in the race, that is largely what it's going to be about. And right now, and you're not, not fighting against not, Joe that's, Biden. That's you're not, fighting against that's Trump. Not a, that's not a pathway for success for the Republican Party. I think a lot of our voters understand that. Yes or no, did Donald Trump lose the 2020 election? Whoever puts their hand on the Bible on January 20th every four years uh, is the winner. Okay, but respectfully... You did not clearly answer that question. And if you can't give a yes or no because on whether or not Trump lost, then how of can course, you... No, of, of course he lost. Uh, Trump uh, lost the 2020 of, election. Of course. Okay. Uh, Joe Biden's the president. But the issue is, I think, what, what people in, in the media and elsewhere, they want to act like somehow this was just like the perfect election. Governor DeSantis fighting his own battle to convince voters and donors that he has a shot at beating Mr. Trump, despite lagging poll numbers, a campaign cash crunch, and relentless attacks from his rivals. Recently, his biggest individual donor threatening to pull back his cash unless Governor DeSantis takes less extreme positions and shows he can win over moderates. A chief concern, the six-week abortion ban DeSantis signed in Florida. It's an issue Democrats have worked to use against him and other Republicans on the campaign trail. The governor has implied the issue should be left to individual states. So would you veto any sort of federal bill that tries to put a nationwide ban in place? So we will be a pro-life president and, and we will support pro-life policies. Um, I would not allow uh, what a lot of the left wants to do, which is to override pro-life protections throughout the country, all the way up really until the moment of birth in some instances, which I think is, is infanticide. Uh, well, it is actually, not... I got to push back on you on that because that that's a, a misrepresentation of, of what's happening. I mean, that 1.3% of abortions happen at 21 weeks or higher. There's no, no right. evidence of Democrats pushing for but, but abortions their view up is, until... Their view is, is that all the way up into that, yet there should not be any legal protections. Uh, there is no in indication of Democrats right, that pushing you're, you're for right. that. Well, yes, they... Much of the DeSantis pitch to voters revolves around being a husband and father, and he's put his family front and center on the campaign trail, whether he's talking his education policy or highlighting his contrast in age with his opponents. But it's DeSantis's wife, Casey, who's arguably become his biggest asset. The former news anchor who grew up in blue-collar Ohio brings the charm and charisma critics often claim her husband lacks. What made you both decide to bring Casey in as such a big part of this campaign? It's can, I, can I answer this for the first one? Okay. So, because it's not like anybody said, oh, we need to deploy Casey to get out there and to do it. No, this is totally because I want to do it. In October 2021, Casey DeSantis was diagnosed with breast cancer. He was there for me, and he was there to go pick up my kids when I couldn't. And he did it with humility, and he did it with love. And I'll tell you what, can't ask for a better husband than that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, I, so... How does it feel, how does it feel to hear her say that? I mean... Well, look, that's, you know, you know, in sickness and in health, that's, that's what you sign up for. I mean, and so she's uh, not only my wife, she's my best friend. And so, you know, this is just what you do. And here in the Hawkeye State, Mr. Trump maintains a big lead, according to a new New York Times Siena poll, 24 points ahead of Mr. DeSantis. Now, that's narrower than his lead nationally, but still a lot of ground to make up here before those Iowa caucuses in January. And you can see a whole lot more of this wide-ranging conversation tonight on NBC Nightly News. And you'll be able to watch the entire thing online on NBCNews.com later today, guys. Dasha, thank you for that information. Great interview. Coming up on Morning News Now, a triumphant return to competition for the GOAT. More on Simone Biles' winning comeback coming up after the break. But first, it was nothing but devastation, not triumph down under for Team USA, who were sent packing from the World Cup after one controversial penalty kick from rival Sweden. We've got the heartbreaking highlights and what's next for the Stars and Stripes up next. 
We are back now with a thrilling comeback in the world of gymnastics. Some call her the greatest of all time. And now Simone Biles is living up to that title. She is the most decorated gymnast of all time. And this weekend, she flipped, she spun, she tumbled her way through a major <laughs> national meet, taking home the top prize. It was her first competition since pulling out of many events at the Tokyo Olympics two years ago to focus on her mental health. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us now with all the exciting action. Maggie, good morning. Hey guys, good morning. This was such an incredible weekend, as you can imagine. You probably saw the crowd inside this suburban Chicago arena was electric, eager to watch Simone Biles make her triumphant return, and triumphant it was. And after taking home the top prize on Saturday, she also took to social media to make it clear that her mental health remains a top priority. She's back. Simone Biles soaring to success, winning Saturday's Core Hydration Classic, her first competition in more than two years. Biles earning first place in the all around, balance beam, floor routine, and the vault. That same event where she struggled and ultimately sidelined herself during 2021's Tokyo Olympic Games. At the time, the four-time gold medalist blaming a case of the twisties, a mental block that throws off a gymnast's ability to track their movements in the air. I have to focus on my mental well-being, and that's what I did. You sure did. That was brave. Thank you. It was hard working five years for a dream and just having to give it up. It was not easy at all. Oh, oh, oh. Biles ultimately taking a two-year break from all competitions to focus on her mental health. Now, the 26-year-old atop the podium once again, wowing crowds alongside Olympic teammates Suni Lee, who placed second on balance beam, and Jordan Childs, finishing fourth on the uneven bars. Biles' important message about taking care of yourself physically and mentally, reaching her young fans. Well, I know that she had a hard time going out of the meet. Biles grateful, writing on Instagram Sunday, tears of joy as I make this comeback, surrounded by the love you've shown. Thank you for believing in me. And we should note, as far as the road ahead, this classic, the Core Hydration Classic, was the final qualifier ahead of the U.S. Gymnastics Championships in California later this month. And Biles' victory this weekend also gives her a shot at the national team ahead of the World Championships. And then, of course, she has a shot as well at her third Olympic appearance in Paris basically next year, about a year from now. And, guys, we should note, Biles was asked this weekend by reporters about looking ahead to the Olympics. She said she's basically taking it one competition at mm. a time, but added, so far, it's heading in the right direction. I think yeah. we would all agree. Guys, I'll send it back off, to you. Off to a pretty good yeah. start. All right, so Maggie, exciting. thank you so much. Thank you. All right, now let's get to some international headlines. In Pakistan, dozens of people are dead after a train derailment. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us from Tel Aviv with that and other world headlines. Raf, good morning. Joe, Savannah, good morning. Yeah, at least 30 people have been killed after that passenger train went off the rails in southern Pakistan. Officials say 10 cars from the Hazara Express went off the track near the Sarhari railway station. At least 90 people were injured, but local authorities say they've now concluded their rescue operation and brought dozens of wounded to safety. In Niger, military coup leaders have now closed the country's airspace. The move comes as a deadline imposed by neighboring African states to restore democracy came and it went. Niger's neighbors have threatened possible military action if the ruling junta does not release the country's imprisoned president. And finally, a big weekend coming up for fans of the Loch Ness Monster. On August 26 and 27, organizers in Scotland are pulling together what's being described as the biggest ever search for the legendary sea creature. Volunteers from around the world are being invited to use drones and other equipment to search for the beast affectionately known as Nessie. And guys, I went on a whale watching trip a few weeks ago where we were guaranteed to see whales no such guarantees on this trip. No, but, but we wish them the best. Yeah, I have so <laughs> many questions about that that we don't have time for, so maybe we'll follow up. Rob, thank you so much. All right, well, the World Cup continued this morning, but without Team USA. The two-time reigning champs were knocked out over the weekend by Sweden in a match that was decided in penalty kicks. The winning goal broke the goal line by a single millimeter. NBC's Molly Hunters in Melbourne, Australia with the fallout. 
For the U.S. women, it was a gut-wrenching end to a hard-fought tournament and the final act to an extraordinary era. I'm so proud of everything that this team has done and everything we've done on the field and everything we've done off the field. And I feel like the game is in a, a great, great place for me to gracefully step away. The legendary Megan Rapinoe subbing in to finish her fourth and final World Cup. After 90 minutes of regulation time against Sweden and an extra 30 minutes still nil-nil. A tense stadium packed with both Swedish and American fans watching as it all came down to penalty kicks. Rapino unbelievably missing her shot. Just some, some dark, dark comedy and me missing <laughs> a penalty in my last game ever. But she wasn't alone. On the final kick from the Swedish team, U.S. goalkeeper Alyssa Nair appears to save the ball. She blocks it, then a second touch to clear it. A moment of uncertainty, the ref pauses, and on review using goal line technology, it was determined that the entire ball crossed the line by a fraction of a centimeter, giving Sweden the win. U.S. goalkeeper Alyssa Nair looking stunned, getting a hug from her teammate Rapino. We just lost the World Cup by a millimeter. <laughs> um, that's tough. To come up short hurts. Um, it's going to hurt for a long time. Outside the Melbourne Stadium, loyal American fans who had traveled halfway across the world were gutted. We tried so hard, we just couldn't finish. So, I mean, it was heartbreak, it's heavy. But an emotional U.S. coach, Vladko Andonovsky, said he wouldn't have done anything differently. You know, I love them, I love them all, and, uh, you know, they're my players, but they're my friends. There's a, there's a group of players here that will make a, uh, make a mark in the future. Molly, thanks so much. Now, after the game, Megan Rapino said that she's leaving the game in good hands. She also said that she has loved every bit of her career. She'll miss it to death. But now is the time to go. For more, let's bring in Ashlyn Harris. She's a two-time World Cup champion with Team USA and Gotham FC Global Creative Advisor. You might remember she was with us just a little less than a week ago right here in studio. Hi, Ashlyn. Thanks so much for joining us again, even though we're so sad to be having this discussion. <laughs> oh, it is. I had to, like, wake up in my jersey. It's still not real to oh, me. But thanks oh. so much for having me. Good morning, everyone. Uh, absolutely. Good morning. So just, yeah, walk us through your reaction. I mean, when we talked a little less than a week ago, like I said, we had discussed how, you know, Team USA had, had a tough go at that point, and then they did play a lot better, it seemed, against Sweden, mm -hmm. but then, of course, losing it in the end in these penalty kicks, the smallest of margins. What's your reaction to that, that millimeter? Uh, it is so heartbreaking. This is the game. It can be so cruel at times, but this is... Unfortunately, what happens when you don't put the ball in the back of the net? Uh, the U.S. came out, had a great performance uh, the entirety of the game, but the goalkeeper for Sweden was standing on her head, had an unbelievable performance. I, I believe sh her stat was 11 saves, which is pretty unheard of at this level. Um, she she won that game for this team, and that's, that's, that's football. At any given day, anything can happen. And that's why we love it so much, mm. but that's also why it's so cruel. And it's sad to see them go this way. Um, it's, it's even, it's more sad to see the narrative right now of the heat the players are taking and, oh. and people undermining the work and dedication that they've put into their craft to be at the highest level. Um, this is really, really hard for people who truly support the team. It, it's, it's been a sad 24 hours, to say the least. Mm. As we keep mentioning, this is also really marking an end of an era with Megan Rapino set to retire from professional soccer at the end of the current NWSL season. Julie Ertz announced her own retirement from the women's national team. We've talked about maybe this is a little bit of a rebuilding year, but where does Team USA go from here now? Well, you know, at this point, we're going to have to really dig in and, and figure out who we are now, right? So the identity of the U.S. has always been this high energy attacking minded uh mentality that we suffocate teams but the, rea the the reality is is teams are just getting better right so we have to continue to evolve we have to keep growing and changing the way the world is and, and that's going to start with our development process that's going to start with uh, the, our nwsl our leagues our local leagues of really getting these players high level competition every single week to prepare them for the world stage. And it's maybe going to take, uh, you know, it, I, I'm not my job, but we got to really dive into who's leading this pack for the next 
four plus years during this cycle because we don't have much time. The Olympics are right around the corner. Mm. We have less than a year to prepare. And this is what we have. There's not much building we can do in the next year. But what I love so much about the U.S. is we have so much talent we have so much grit and, and this is going to burn and sting for a really long mm. time. We have to use this now to fuel us going into the Olympics. Mm. This is, of course, I mean, this is the biggest event in soccer. We just saw the World Cup. But, uh, you know, there's always this surge in excitement and focus on the team, of course, during this time. But after the tournament, tournament ends, how can fans continue to support women's soccer? Yeah, so this is so important, and, and I really pre appreciate this question because the NWSL, the National Women's Soccer League here in the U.S., is in everyone's backyard. Uh, we play, you know, here in New York and at, at Red Bull Arena, and it, it's important for fans to continue to show up for these women. We we are doing such incredible things in our community and, and giving young children this belief that they can be these players one day. And we need to continue supporting and putting dollars into ticket sales and sponsorship sales because at the end of the day, investment is so important for the success of these women. Mm. So my hope is everyone continues to buy tickets to games, show up to games, because really this is just the start. And, and make no mistake, this women's national team is the best in the world. They just fell short this mm. one time. Ashlyn Harris, it's been a joy to talk to you throughout this tournament. Thank you for joining us this morning, even though it's sad news. We appreciate you being here. <sighs> Thank you so much. Have a great week. All right, coming up, a potential medical breakthrough for the many women who are suffering from postpartum depression in America. After the break, we'll take a closer look at a new treatment that's just been approved by the FDA. What does it do? Who should take it? And when does it hit pharmacy shelves? The doctor is in up next. We're back now with what police believe is a foiled murdered for hire plot. A mother of three from Georgia was arrested in the Bahamas after authorities say she conspired with two other men to kill her husband. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander has more on the story. Well, Lindsay Shiver had frequently visited the Bahamas with her husband and their three children. It was a favorite family vacation spot. But now she is being held there on charges of murder conspiracy, accused of plotting to kill her husband. On social media, they were the perfect picture of a happy couple. Ooh. The polar bear plunge. <laughs> but in reality, police say Lindsay Scheiber was plotting to kill her husband of 13 years. Now she and two other men are facing murder conspiracy charges. Happy birthday, big guy. According to news reports from the Bahamas, police allegedly discovered the plot while investigating a separate crime. While searching for evidence on a cell phone, police say they uncovered the alleged plan to kill 38-year-old Robert Shiver. The key will be what exactly was said in these text messages. And the defense will have to revolve around having some other explanation for what was said in those text messages other than the interpretation that this was a conspiracy to kill her husband. The couple met at Auburn University, where Robert played on the football team. Lindsay, a former beauty pageant contestant. <laughs> the couple later moved to Georgia, where they are raising their three boys. Both Lindsay and Robert would often share happy videos and pictures of their lives on social media. On their anniversary in 2020, Lindsay wrote, the key to a perfect marriage is having two imperfect people who refuse to give up on each other. But in April, Robert filed for divorce. In court filings, Robert accused his wife of adulterous conduct, saying their marriage is irretrievably broken and requesting primary physical custody of their children. In a response filing not obtained by NBC News, Lindsay said any extramarital relationship she had was during the party's separation and was condoned by Robert. According to Bahamas Court News, prosecutors say Lindsay had an intimate relationship with one of her accused co-conspirators. Her lawyer, who did not respond to our request for comment, told CNN his client was granted a $100,000 bail, but will be required to wear an ankle monitoring device and remain in the Bahamas. <laughs> now, a shattered image of their seemingly happy marriage as police try to piece together a motive for the alleged plot. 
and we did reach out to Robert Shiver. A family spokesperson declined to comment. Meanwhile, Lindsay Shiver and the two men who are facing charges along with her have not yet entered a plea. They're due back in court in October. Back to you. All right, Blaine, thank you so much. Now to a potentially major breakthrough in postpartum care. On Friday, the FDA approved the first pill to treat postpartum depression. Yeah, the new pill is from Sage Therapeutics, and it's called Zoranolone. And experts say the medication will likely expand the number of women who can be treated for postpartum depression. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now with more on this. Hi, Dr. Azar. Good morning. So important just to be shedding a light, I think, generally on any type of postpartum depression, psychosis, anxiety. There are so many different things that we don't talk about it enough. And just first tell us, what are the signs and symptoms of postpartum depression? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people sometimes get confused a little bit about what's normal mm -hmm. after childbirth. We call them the baby blues for about the first two weeks. There's sort of a sudden drop and fluctuation in hormones, and it's very normal for women to feel a little bit down, a little bit blue, a little anxious. But postpartum depression is different. It is and, and, and can mimic traditional depression um, in terms of, you know, losing interest in things that normally would make you happy, very depressed mood, appetite, concentration changes. It can happen actually in the later stage of pregnancy and any time in the first year after childbirth. But what really makes postpartum depression unique from just regular depression is a lot of these feelings are centered around obviously being a new mother. And in cases of severe postpartum depression, women can have suicidal thoughts. They can even have thoughts of hurting their baby. That's what really makes it a medical emergency and why this treatment really, really could be practice changing. So Dr. Azar, let's talk more about the treatment. How should it be taken? And remi remind us who it's for, because not everyone can mm -hmm. take it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a it's a pill that's taken by mouth every two uh, for two weeks, I should say. Um, it is not indicated for women who are breastfeeding. Um, women are also advised to use contraception in the two weeks that they're taking the medication, as well as for one week after taking the medication because it can cause fetal harm. And again, the distinction here is that it's not really recommended or not less necessarily approved at this time for women who have what we would refer to as mild or moderate postpartum depression, but rather women who are experiencing more severe symptoms, as you mentioned, perhaps psychosis, perhaps suicidal thoughts, or thoughts of hurting their own baby. When can we expect this pill to be available? So Savannah, they say uh, third quarter of 2023, which really means by the end of the year. Um, you know, we don't yet have uh, any details in terms of, of pricing or insurance coverage or anything like that. But, you know, the hope, of course, is that with potentially patient assistance programs and just the sheer need um, for uh, such a, an effective and safe therapeutic for these women, that it will become, uh, you know, very, very widely available for women who actually need it. Absolutely. And in the meantime, talk about these issues. Talk to your doctor, talk to your partner, all that type of stuff. Dr. Izar, thank you so much. Great Absolutely. to see you. Now to a dramatic rescue at sea. A man's small boat was sinking 12 miles from shore. Missing for more than a day, his family almost lost hope. NBC News correspondent Marissa Parra has his harrowing survival story. In the moments after a miraculous rescue, gratitude hits this mother like a wave. We cannot thank the Coast Guard, Fire Rescue, St. August to everybody. We just want to say thank you so much. This was her son, Charles Gregory, just hours before. The 25-year-old seen hugging his knees, lone and lost at sea for almost two days after a fishing trip gone wrong. He lost his engine when he got swept out to sea at some point his vessel capsized. He lost all his uh, survivor equipment, including his phone, which he would have been able to use to call out to us. The clock was ticking. He had no food, no water, and his boat was on the brink of sinking, forced to tread the Florida ocean for as long as his body and the sharks would let him. That any kind of marine life would be a concern. Rescuers desperate for a sign of life finally spotted a sight for sore eyes early Saturday morning. There was the 25-year-old waving at them from a boat half full. We didn't want his legs to give out underneath him based on the fact that he had been out there for such a great period of time. Loaded onto a gurney on land with cracked lips and skin from the sun, Charles gives his frantic parents a weak sign he's okay. There is a God up there. If you ever thought it wouldn't, let your kid go missing offshore in the friggin' ocean for 38 hours. I gave up hope. I should never give up hope. Don't give up on the big guy.
Wow. Our thanks to Marissa Parra for that story. Never That's give up hope. Right. Oh, all right, coming up, we're heading back to school this morning in the middle of one scorcher of a summer. After the break, we're going to take a closer look at how those sky-high temps are affecting students in the classroom and how those sky-high prices for supplies are affecting parents. It's next. Stick around. Well, back to school season is getting into full swing, but between the soaring costs of supplies because of inflation and the extreme summer heat this year brings some serious challenges for students and families. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is in Miami now with more on this. Hey, Sam, good morning. Savannah, good morning. I don't think heatflation was a thing, but it definitely is now. In Miami, where I am, it's almost 95 degrees in the morning. And as you look across the country at all these kids going back to school from New Orleans to Atlanta, Southern California and Palm Springs, they're approaching or above 100 degrees as they get back into the classrooms. And then on the school supply side, they've gone up, Savannah, 24 percent in just two years in terms of cost. The average family spending almost $900. Here's some ways to spend wisely as you get to the back to school season. The rush to stock up on supplies and clothing for the new school year is on. But with inflation raising prices on many staple items, families are taking advantage of any break they can get. We're going to recycle what we already have at home. And whatever we're missing, that's what we're going to get this year to make sure it fits into the budget because everything is double the price. Nine states had tax holidays over the weekend, including Florida, where shoppers flocked to stores like this one in Miami, trying to scoop up some savings. Notebooks have like composition notebooks. They used to be like 25 cents, 50 cents, and now they're like a dollar fifty. According to a survey by the National Retail Federation, an average family with children in elementary through high school plans to spend a record $890 on back to school items this year, up from 630 just a decade ago. Total spending on school-related items expected to reach $41.5 billion. It's more than many Americans can afford, but some communities are stepping up to ease the burden. Like Webb Middle School in Garland, Texas, hosting its first back-to-school block party. Hundreds turning up to get free school supplies, haircuts, even school photos. Parents sometimes, like, we're having to choose between a lunchbox and school supplies or haircuts. What are we going to do? And so the, the idea of this was to be able to do it all. As the hunt for deals intensifies, the summer continues to scorch. And some students are already back to school amidst the sweltering heat wave. It's hot being out here. It's really bad. I don't, I wish I could have done online. Stay home with the AC. Other schools are already in session this week in hot spots like New Orleans and Palm Springs, California, where classes are set to start on Wednesday. They're modifying schedules to keep students cool in the searing heat. You don't have kids outside for a full recess period, and on some days you don't have kids outside at all. But inside may not be so cool in all schools, some struggling with faulty AC systems. One federal report from 2021 found that 41% of school districts required HVAC system upgrades or replacements in at least half of their schools. An urgent problem as summers get hotter and back to school means a fight to stay cool. So Sam, if kids are heading back in this heat, like where you are, 95 degrees first thing in the morning, what can you do to keep them safe? <laughs> Yeah, look, when you hear about those creaky HVAC statistics, Savannah, it certainly can be a little unnerving for parents. There are things you can do, though. Most importantly, make sure the back of the neck and forehead for your child is always cool. A lot of schools right now are allowing for pre-moistened towels and wraps to make sure that your students are safe. Pack nourishing snacks. You think about electrolytes through fluid, but foods like dried apricots also have electrolytes. Check out the classroom conditions so you can advocate on behalf of your kid. And also make sure they're spending at least a couple of hours every single day. If they don't have see at home or at school, in a library or a cooling center, those steps, Savannah, will go a long way. Back oh, to you. Absolutely. All right, Sam, stay cool. Thanks so much. So financial headlines now. A new report is shining a pretty shocking light on credit card debt in America. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us again with that and other money news. Hey, Silvana. 
Hey, Savannah. Hey, Jill. Yes. Yeah, so listen to this. More than 50 million Americans have been in credit card debt for at least a year. A new report from Bankrate finds nearly half of those people are carrying debt from month to month. About three quarters of cardholders with credit card debt and annual household incomes of $100,000 have been in debt for at least a year. The most common reasons for credit card debt, unexpected and emergency expenses such as medical bills or home repairs, day-to-day -day expenses like groceries and child care, retail purchases and vacation or entertainment expenses. Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg says a web version of Threads and a search function should be coming in the next few weeks. The desktop version has been among the biggest requests by users. Threads has also rolled out the ability to see your liked post through an update over the weekend. They can also now sort their following list by latest first or earlier first. And stock up on your Christmas ornaments and tinsel now. Christmas Tree Shop says this Saturday, August 12th, is the final day to shop at its stores. The retailer, which filed for bankruptcy in May, is set to close its remaining 49 stores in 16 states. Christmas Tree Shops took out a loan this spring, but creditors terminated it after the company defaulted on the terms due to worsening revenues and it failed to find a buyer, guys. All right. Savannah, thank you so much. Appreciate you it. it. If you feel like you are seeing more and more of those self-checkout lanes in your grocery stores or pharmacies, you might be on to something. Some retailers say, like it or not, self-checkout is on the rise and it is not going anywhere. NBC News correspondent George Solis has more on why we might all be DIYing it soon at the grocery store. Place your item in the bagging area. They are supermarket contraptions. Help is on the way. Causing super headaches. Place your item in the bagging area. The self-checkout lane. I hate self-checkout. Those machines do not work. Last resort. Last resort for me. But despite the hate, stores are ringing up even more of them. I always have to call somebody to come over anyway. It makes like so such a, for a difficult time. Kroger, one of the nation's largest supermarket chains, has just converted one of its stores to self-checkout only. Walmart and Dollar General also experimenting with no man registers. If your store went full self-checkout, how big of a problem would that be for you? Huge. But are we now at a point where it is here to stay forever? Oh, or? yeah. I don't see we're turning back on this. Stu Leonard Jr. owns seven stores in the New York area and says he's noticed an obvious trend. The younger people embrace it and, and love to use it more than older people. I don't see much gray hair in the self-checkout line. He says 75% of his customers still prefer human cashiers, so he's keeping them. But there are labor savings with self-checkout. We have one cashier for one customer at the regular checkout line. Over here, we try to have eight of them, I think, and we have two people on board right now. The ratio now goes four to one. There's some growing pains associated with yeah, it. Yeah, just like any technology, you know, self-checkout through our growing pains. Here's where things can really go off the rails. This can of beans, no problem. One, These organic one, bananas, well, that's a whole nother story. Help is required for this item. Help is on the way. Leonard believes the technology will get better and customers will get more used to it. Others, however, aren't as optimistic. I don't think that there's one shopper in the nation who would like to go to an all self-checkout store. And frankly, as these retailers are putting in more stores that are only self-checkout, I think their sales are going to decline. By one estimate, 95% of stores now have some form of self-checkout, so it's unlikely any of them yes. will bag the concept yes. soon. George Solis, NBC News, New York. Quite the debate. Yes, I'm team go to the cashier and have them do it for you. I don't mind self checkout. I'm mm. like, boom, 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 out of here. I don't know, but I get the point. All right, coming up, a teacher student bond that will now last a lifetime. Literally, after the break, a life changing surgery that had one teen's teacher raising his hand to help. You're watching Morning News now. Welcome back. A rare Pacific walrus calf. Look at this. 
is safe this morning after he was found miles from the ocean. This cuddly little guy is about one month old and 140 pounds. Look at him. Look how sweet this is. Well, he was found last week wandering alone, dehydrated, and fighting an infection. And get this, baby walruses depend on maternal care for the first two years of their lives. But now he's receiving 24-7 care at the Alaska Sea Life Center. And the good news is that he's eating well and staying alert. But right there, he looks very cute asleep. Joe, what do you think? <laughs> Thank goodness for that rescue. My goodness. Oh, how sweet. All right. Love to see that. Thanks, mm -hmm. Savannah. Mm -hmm. Finally this hour, a heartwarming story about a teacher in Ohio who raised his hand to help one of his students, changing the boy's life forever. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch has that story. For years, Roman McCormick struggled. I have constantly was tired. I had low energy. The 15-year-old was born with a condition known as BOR syndrome, impacting his kidneys. I look forward to seeing him and playing soccer every weekend, and now saying, I'm sorry, Dad, I'm just too tired. You know, it just, it just really broke my heart. It was clear Roman needed a new kidney, but after months of waiting, his family couldn't find a donor. So they went public, Roman's parents pleading for help. Can you do anything for your kid? They were feeling desperate until late June when they got a surprise phone call. Not only is there a donor, it's me, his, his geometry teacher. Eddie McCarthy, Roman's ninth grade math teacher, heard the family's pleas. You know, I think the guilt would have just been so much if I was just like, hey, Roman, praying for you. So without telling yeah. Roman or his parents, Eddie went through extensive testing. I wouldn't want to get their hopes up. And learned he was a match. What did it mean to you to realize that your teacher was going to do this for you? I was wondering, did I get that good of grades to deserve this? Just last month, both Roman and Eddie had their surgeries. So excited. And nearly two weeks later, we were there as the duo reunited. Good to see you, man. Excited to see you after a while. Now Roman's excited to play soccer again. Can't wait to start doing what I've wanted to do since I was 13. That's a huge part of my life, being active and having fun. It's awesome to be able to give him that gift. <laughs> Thank you, guys. A priceless <laughs> gift Roman's grateful family <laughs> won't soon forget. Much. This means the world to me, so. Oh, we love you. Yeah. Thank you. Love you guys. We'll be forever connected. Connected by a teacher-student bond unlike any other. And my teacher saved my life. Jesse Kirsch, NBC News, Toledo, Ohio. I love how Roman's like, I didn't know my grades were that good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right? Oh, it's so funny. Oh, God, we know teachers do so much. They're heroes just every day in the classroom. But what a gift. No kidding. A they parent's so much. relief. They finally hear that from somebody they know in their own circle. Oh, it's very cool. Thank goodness for those donors. All right, that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But don't go anywhere. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.